Welcome back to Morbidly Bewitched. In the last video, I discussed a curious case at the Mütter Museum, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about mausoleums. So stay tuned. Before I go any further, um, I have had my hair cut. Yes, I have. I almost feel like I've kind of lost a superpower because I'm not exaggerating when I say I've had about 16 inches cut off. Mm-hmm. Don't know if you end up. Anyway, I have also got a new rug. It's down there, you can't see it. But it means I had to slightly change the camera angle. And I'm also wearing a different top. Yes, it's still black, but it's different. So there is many different places where we can choose to bury our dead. This could be, well, the most common ones, the grave. But there's vaults, there's crypts, there's mausoleums, the necropolis. But today I'm going to be discussing mausoleums. The word mausoleum comes from a Greek ruler and king called Mausolus. Mausolus of Caria died in 353 BC and his burial chamber was built in 350 BC and was of such splendour that his name, his surname Mausolus, was forevermore attached to this form of interment. What is a mausoleum. A mausoleum is basically an above ground structure that is designed to hold the deceased. It can either be privately owned or public. Years and years ago, mausoleums were really only associated with royalty or allocated to extremely wealthy and important families. Privately owned mausoleums is something that I would I suppose maybe being in the UK, I would consider that more correct to be termed as a vault. These are the gorgeous miniature mansions. They're above ground structures that you would see dotted around some of the really old cemeteries across the UK. You can still have a vault, a family vault erected today but they are so expensive because it's not just as straightforward as going in and buying a grave, a normal burial plot. You have to write to the cemetery authorities. You have to purchase that large area of land from the cemetery itself. You then have to go through all this red tape because you need planning permission, you need foundations, you need architects, you need stonemasons. It's a ridiculously intense structure to get involved with to erect for a family. However, whenever they are there, they're, they're beautiful. They can be in any specific design to the owner. So they could be Gothic, they could be Greek, Romanic, they could be steepled, rounded and arched. There's endless choices of how you would want your family vault to be designed but they are extremely expensive. These little miniature mansions will have a, quite a wide doorway to get into them. Once inside the vault, the coffin can either be placed on shelving, which means the minute you go inside the vault, the coffin is right there. You can actually see the full length, the full coffin. Or the coffin can be housed within the structure behind the wall and the wall itself is inscribed just like a headstone would be. The other option is a stone sarcophagus, an outer shell that covers the entire coffin in the centre of the room. Public mausoleums, on the other hand, are extremely large buildings where you walk in through massive double doors and they go right up. The ceiling's huge. Or it can be like an area where they're individually standing structures, not within a building. And of course, with the public mausoleum, the entire coffin goes into a niche and a stone slab is set in front and engraved like a headstone. 
There are some over here in Northern Ireland and the UK, some impressive vaults uh, across the land, like Greyfriars in Edinburgh. It's stunning. But for public mausoleums, that's not something that we really do over here, with exception to the Swanky Bridgewater Mausoleum in London, boasting 690 chambers. So what about the structure of a mausoleum? Well, they're very cleverly designed. So when a niche is opened for the interment of a coffin in a public mausoleum, it is extremely slight to the point it's not really evident to the human eye, but the shelving itself that the coffin sits on is at a slight slope backwards away from the internal unit of the mausoleum itself. This is just in case something leaks. And if something does leak, it doesn't happen all the time, but if it does, that then drains back away from where the public would be into the drainage system, just standard drainage system. And because nobody really wants to walk into a mausoleum with a smell, the internal filtration of mausoleums are all very well vented to allow for fresh airflow. And again, this is all internal and out through the back of the premises and the building. So the public do not see this internal mechanism or structure that's been built in and designed to avoid smells, leakages from the front, and all of those nasty scenarios that people really don't want to see. Which means that with a well-kept, well-cared-for mausoleum, these nasties um, never rear their ugly head. And it just looks like an absolutely beautiful granite or marble structure. There is, however, a slight catch to a mausoleum. Mm. You don't get to stay there indefinitely. No, nope. not like the opening of a grave where once you're in there, that's you. Mausoleums are leased, so the niche that you are in is usually contracted for either 20, 50, 75 or 99 years. At which point another family member has to have your lease reinstated or you're out. This lease is also quite expensive and it gets more expensive depending on where you want your niche. Let's face it, if you put granny at the very, very top of the ceiling, you're not really going to get to see her slab. Or if you put Uncle Jimmy down at the very bottom, he's also ground level's not that swanky. You would obviously be wanting mid-level, but they're more expensive. And if you have one of the fancier mausoleums where there's actually views across the cemetery and it's really lush and pretty, you can actually have a niche that has a view as such. And these are more expensive. Join me in my next video where I will be discussing what happens when a mausoleum goes wrong. Please subscribe and I'll see you soon.